Hello and welcome to another episode of Mean Brews. Today I'm covering Goza, that historic salty sour beer from Germany. Uh, let's get right into the data. I found 18 Goza recipes, uh, one best of show, nine gold, six silver, and two bronze. Uh, the, the histogram for when these recipes were uh, won competition started in 2016 and ended in 2022. Really wasn't a frequent style brewed uh, before 2016, so not a lot of history uh, as far as home brewers are concerned in brewing this, this style of beer. Uh, the BJCP style is 23G, a tart, lightly bittered, historical Central European wheat beer with a distinctive but restrained salt and coriander character. Very refreshing with a dry finish, high carbonation, and bright flavors. Um, as you can expect, not a lot of evolution with only, what, uh, six years of, of uh, brewing history here uh, and very little variation between uh, the recipes that have won. Uh, looking at original gravity, uh, the BJCP range is 1.036 uh, to 1.058. Uh, the average was 1.047, and there's no movement on that. It's pretty much sticking there throughout the, the years of uh, entering. Uh, final gravity, this is really this is really telling to me. A very narrow range for BJCP, 1.06 to 1.010. Um, but the w styles that are winning are, have a huge sweep, 1.002 to 1.031, with the bias being a higher uh, final gravity that's outside the range. This tells me that uh, judges are preferring the sweeter, uh, a, a more residual sweetness in this beer than what sh it should have. Um, the mean is 1.011. Um, my beer will stay true to style, 1.09, based upon the, the attenuation of the yeast I selected and the mashing profile. Um, IBUs anywhere between 0 and 14 uh, was the winning beers. Uh, the BJCP range is 5 to 12. Uh, the average was 5, which is on the very bottom end of the range, and that's where my... Um, my beer will be uh, my recipe. Uh, color, very again, a narrow band, uh, three to four SRM. <laughs> the average is right in the middle there, uh, 3.5 or 6.9 EBC. Um, my malts that I chose are going to put me within the band, but uh, slightly on the higher end of that. Um, very simple malt bill. Um, of the 18 recipes, only one used any other type of malt other than base malts. 99% uh, base malt and a fraction of a, of a percentage of crystal malt. Um, here's a distribution of malt to use. Um, you have that one recipe here that used um, uh, crystal malt, um, anywhere between 90 and 100% of the grist was uh, uh, base malt. And I will be at 100% base malt on my recipe. Uh, again, only one recipe, 10% of the recipes used uh, crystal. Um, if you look at the base malts used, there were four different base malts used in different propensity. Um, wheat malt, 100% of the recipes used wheat malt at around 50 to 55% of the grist. And then slightly below that was Pilsner malt, uh, anywhere between 45, probably 46, 47% of the grist. Uh, a few recipes used a pale malt as well as or in uh, supplementing or replacing the Pilsner. Uh, two row pale. Uh, between 50 and 60% of the grist, um, the average at 40. Uh, and then one recipe used Munich 1 at 20%. Uh, I'll be using right at the averages here for, I think it's 5347 uh, wheat to, to Pilsner malt. Crystal malt, 10% of the grist, only one recipe uh, used Carapils as their crystal malt. Um, looking at the spices used, this is kind of interesting. Um, the highest, um, the most likely used spices are salt and coriander. That's traditional to the style. Interestingly enough, not 100% of the recipes that have won use these spices. Um, we also had orange peel down here in red. Um, we had lime peel, and then somebody used cumin. Um, I had to double ask this person, are you sure it's not coriander? Uh, and they came back and said, yep, it's cumin. I use cumin in my goza. So... Uh, very interesting there, but very small amount of cumin used. Um, the average amounts here was 
0.12 ounces per gallon for the salt and 0 0.10 ounces per gallon for coriander. And I'm going to stick with those. I didn't see any shift over time in those amounts. I mean, some of these are huge, huge amounts of salt, um, but I'm sticking with the averages here. We had six different bittering hops used, Middle Fru, Galaxy Sots, Tetanang, and Willamette and Motueka. Um, I'm going to stick with Howler here. Um, some people didn't hop at all, but we're seeing a trend where people, the use of bittering hops is increasing over time with a pretty good correlation coefficient here, 0 0.33. Um, no flavor hops. Nobody used any flavor hops in this recipe at all, but we did have three uh, different aroma hops used, Tet, Motuek, and Galaxy. Um, I'm not going to use any. It just is, in, is not used in enough recipes to, to, for me to think that it, it needs to be in this style. We had read one recipe that didn't use any hops but dry hops. This was interesting. It's on the AHA website. This recipe also fermented start to finish with lacto and um, sack, din bitter, dry hopped with citra, um, fermented at 113 all the way through. Uh, very interesting recipe. Um, we're not going to use any dry hops here. Um, rate of hop additions. Um, 16, 17% used uh, aroma hop. Uh, so not enough for me to pull it into my recipe. The rate of uh, aroma hops was 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 ounces per gallon. This is, this is one ounce. This is half an ounce in a five gallon batch. And then the dry hop was very, very low. Um, just a scant use of dry hops uh, in that one recipe. Mash type, we had one decoction. Uh, majority were single infusion, and I'm going to stick with a single infusion for my recipe. Uh, the mash rest, the decoction used um, a 15 minute average of protein rest of 131. Uh, a beta rest, the average was about 145, and it was 30 minute average. And then um, for the main sacrification rest, 65 minute average at a value of 152 Fahrenheit. Uh, but a big range here for uh, sacrification rest. I'm gonna just do a single infusion at 149. And the reason is we're seeing that uh, fermentation temperature dropping, which I assume to try to get the a more fermentable wort. Uh, and so I'm reflecting that. Very good uh, correlation coefficient here. I'm reflecting that in my recipe. Uh, we're also seeing an increase in the time, uh, uh, mash time, um, from about 40 to about 80 minutes. So again, trying to get as fermentable wort as possible um, and produce as much sugars as possible for the lacto and the, the yeast to attenuate this fully. All right, on to the souring method. This is pretty interesting. The major, vast majority were kettle soured. 78% of the recipes were kettle soured. And then one each, we had one that produced its sourness through the use of acid malt, a huge amount of acid malt. Uh, we had one that used a souring yeast, such as Philly Sour or some of the new yeasts that are out on the market nowadays. One that used uh, just straight up lactic acid uh, to get the pH desired. And then one that used a primary ferment sour that co-pitched uh, yeast and lactic, uh, lactic acid producing bacteria and just let it age to get the sourness it needs. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna kettle sour this one uh, just because it supports the data that I'm seeing. Uh, what kind of lactobacillus strains are used? Um, uh, lact plantarium was the most common. Plantarium is used in Good Belly and in the Omega Lacto blend. So, you know, when I saw them use either of those, I would split out the individual strains just to show, you know, what's used. 56% of the recipes use plantarium. Brevis, which I think is the other strain that's used in uh, Omega Lacto, 22% of the recipes. Paraskasei, uh, this is used the other strain in Good Belly. So these are all the Good Belly or Omega Lacto uh, yeast. Uh, sorry, uh, bacteria used for this recipe. Somebody just threw Pilsner malt in there and let it go. And then these two here, I've got a good buddy, Jeremiah Bear, who has won at NHC with his, and he swears by this strain. So don't feel constrained by this. I will be using um, the Omega Lacto uh, for convenience and for um, because the data supports it. 
Um, but do do play with this to see if you can uh, get some different flavors out of there. Again, the plant, plantarum use is just skyrocketing here. So, uh, kettle souring temps. Um, I broke it down just like I do fermentation yeast strains. Oh, so when you look at all of them, the average was right around let's say 199 to 100. Um, these these two, I'm going to be using the Omega Lacto. <clears throat> these are the two strains, the Omega Lacto, and they line up right at 94. And then these are the two strains for Good Belly, and they again line up at 94. So you can guess I'm fermenting or kettle souring mine at 94 Fahrenheit. Uh, kettle souring duration anywhere between 24 to 48 hours. The sweet spot seems to be right at about 38 hours. Um, I wouldn't be rigid to this because this, this is a non-consistent process. Um, definitely go until you get the pH you want. Don't check until 38. The more you open, the more you're exposed to oxygen, the more likely you get other bugs in there you don't want. Um, but start checking at about 38 hours in and then let it go if you still see it dropping or, or start the next part of the process if it's, if it's done. Um, what were the pHs before and after kettle souring? Most people, except one recipe over here, most people pre-acidified their wort uh, prior to kettle souring to, to an average of 4.7 pH. And the drop that they were looking for was down to about 3.4. Um, so I'm going to try to hit that with uh, by pre-acidifying with lacto to 4.7 and then looking to hit around 3.4 pH um, when I finish. Uh, boil duration, we had some zero-minute boils. They didn't boil at all. Uh, and then we had some, they just pasteurized. Um, and some that went up to a uh, 90-minute boil. Um, the average was 40 minutes. Um, if you're going to do this, make sure you pasteurize it fully. You don't want that lacto contaminating your system uh, in the future for future batches. Uh, I'm going to do a 40-minute boil in line with the data. Um, the yeast used, Chico's most prominent um, this is the sac toit uh, that they thought was a Brett for a while, unicorn dust. Kolsch, there are three different Kolsch or alt strains, so clean fermenting ale strains. This 029, 007, and then K97, which put it as a, a big enough component, a, a big enough competitor to Chico. So if you're going to pick a strain, you want a German strain, use a Kolsch or an alt strain uh, or Chico. They're, they're both, I think, very... Uh, well suited for this. And we have that Philly sour. Then we have some some odd ones. Orval used in one recipe. Verdant IPA used in another. Vian Stefan used in one, and, and a Vosk-Vike uh, used in, in yet another. So good, interesting mix of yeast used here. Uh, each one bringing its own unique flavors to this style. I'm going to stick with Chico. Really available, and it wins. This is mash water chemistry. Um, obviously, the sodium will go up once you add the salt. Um, 37 for uh, calcium, 5 for magnesium, 12 for sodium, 43 for sulfate, 37 chloride. I am almost on all those numbers. I saw no uh, change in time uh, to those numbers. So this is what you go in the mash with. Um, fermentation temperatures, anywhere between 58 and 113. This was that one recipe over here at 113 that just fermented and lactoed everything all at once at 113. Um, it's on the HA website if you see it. Uh, 001 had a very tight band here of 71 to 73. Uh, and then the others were, were on the low side of this range uh, for uh, unicorn dust, which is the Brett or Sactois and the um, Col Fru Kolsch strain which is uh, green. I'm going to be at 65. And the reason is we're seeing a change in time with a good correlation coefficient of uh, 65 being the temperature that uh, people are moving to. Um, other values, carbonation volumes, average was 2.57 volumes of CO2 and mash pH was not reported. People were more concerned about kettle pH and final pH. Uh, so nobody reported what their mash pH was. Understandably. So I'm going to shoot for about 5.3 mash pH. All right. Mean beer's recipe, very simple. It's all process-driven, this style. 
uh, 53% white wheat, 47% Pilsner, two row. Get as light colored as you can for both of those. Um, for the hops, we're going to put in five IBUs of middle fruit at 40 minutes. It's a 40 minute boil. Um, we're going to use um, canning salt, which is sodium chloride at a rate of 0.12 ounce per gallon or 0.9 grams per liter and crushed coriander. Crush it up in a mortar and pestle or in a grinder, clean spice grinder. Um, we're going to put that in at 10 minutes, 0.1 ounce per gallon or 0.7 grams per liter. And we're going to use a Chico strain and a mega lacto for the kettle souring. Shooting for original gravity of 1.047 with five IBUs. Uh, the water chemistry is as such. Um, we're going to get the mash pH to 5.3. Make sure you use lactic acid. That's a flavor component of this style. So don't use phosphoric or anything else. Uh, lactic acid is what you want. Uh, infusion mash at 149 Fahrenheit or 65 Celsius for 80 minutes. After mashing, sparge as you normally would into a kettle for souring. Uh, you're, at this point, you're going to acidify the wort to 4.7 pH using lactic acid. You're going to heat the kettle up to, I put 180 Fahrenheit or 82 Celsius for five minutes to to pasteurize the wort. You want to kill uh, all the bugs that are in there um, before you pitch your lacto. You're going to chill it down to 95 Fahrenheit or 35 Celsius, and you're going to pitch a mega lacto. Seal it tightly. Cellophane wrap is probably the best because it's very oxygen imper impermeable. Um, and then put the lid on it or something something else to, to you know further protect it. You want to limit that oxygen exposure as much as possible. Kettle sour this at 95 Fahrenheit, 35 Celsius for 38 hours or until your pH of 3.4 is reached. If it stalls out, um, probably just add lactic acid to 3.4 uh, if it stalls. Uh, boil it for 40 minutes and you're going to add your hops as usual. Um, you're going to add the, the salt and the coriander at 10 minutes. Chill it to 64 Fahrenheit, 18 Celsius, and pitch uh, a small starter of Chico. Uh, I say a one liter starter for a five gallon batch. Ferment it at 65 Fahrenheit or 18 Celsius for seven days, then bottle or keg to 2.6 volumes of CO2. All right, that's it for today. Um, I'll let you know in the comments of this video what the next style is going to be once I uh, decide what it is. Thank you for tuning in this time and uh, happy brewing. I hope you get to try this recipe and let me know how, you, how it goes because I've never made this one actually. Uh, but happy brewing everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye.